Brightstorm has thousands of high-quality videos covering all major subjects. Please check out more at www.brightstorm.com. One of my favorite systems to teach about is the nervous system. And this is because it's the voice talking inside your head. It's what's watching me right now. And the nervous system is one of the two major control systems of the body. It works with the endocrine system to help control and regulate the activities of the body and maintain homeostasis. Now, when studying the nervous system, you got to be kind of careful because it's been something that's been just inspiring scientists to dive into the research for years and years. And so each scientist tries to organize it and they've organized it in many different ways. And so sometimes kids get confused, which one's what? Well, there's one way of organizing things based on essentially, it's like geography. It's just where are the continents? And that's saying the central nervous system versus the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system is the brain and spinal cord, all right, the stuff in the middle. Whereas the peripheral nervous system is all the nerves coming off of the brain called cranial nerves and all of the nerves coming off of the spinal column or the spinal cord called the spinal nerves. All right. Now within the peripheral nervous system, they'll make the distinction between the somatic nervous system, which is the part of your um, nervous system that controls your skeletal muscles. In other words, it's my somatic nervous system that I actuate in, or activate in order to do this or that. Why? I don't know. But the autonomic nervous system controls everything else. Now, that's a really broad category because it's really a lot of things. It's the autonomic nervous system that helps you regulate how open or closed blood vessels are to different parts of your body. Uh, your autonomic nervous system adjusts the size of the uh, pupil, the hole in your iris that allows more or less light in based on how much light you're looking at. In general, people think of the somatic nervous system as being the voluntary part, the consciously controlled part, while the autonomic is the unconsciously controlled stuff. Now, again, there's some blurring going on here. When you walk, very rarely do you actively sit there and think, how am I balancing? How do I need to adjust the muscles of my trunk, my abdomen, to keep me from falling over? Even though technically that would fall under the somatic nervous system. And autonomic stuff, well, you can have some input into that. If you start working at it, there's Buddhist monks who will sit there and they can learn how to control blood flow and other really bizarre things. Now within the autonomic nervous system, there's a further subdivision. There's the sympathetic nervous division or nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system or nervous division. Now the sympathetic division in general you can lump that together as it controls the fight or flight type responses. In other words, getting you ready for action. Whereas the parasympathetic nervous division in general gets you ready for resting and repairing. Now, usually most body parts are being given signals by both of these and they're usually in some kind of balance. You're very rarely all the way sympathetic and no parasympathetic or vice versa. And when you're going through your normal life, they're just sitting there adjusting based on uh, input on what your body needs and even your conscious mind can influence this. Now, to help you think through what would the sympathetic nervous division control? What kinds of body parts would it send blood to? What kinds of actions or effects would it have on your body? And versus the parasympathetic, let's start thinking about, hmm, close your eyes and just kind of relax a little bit. And in your head, imagine it's 3 a.m. You're in your bed, oh, you're just sleeping, you're just doing that kind of surfing between consciousness and rest, and you just feel so wonderfully relaxed. The room is dark, it's perfectly quiet, and all of a sudden you hear, <laughs> and somebody licks your ear. Now, how would your body react? Your heart would start increasing as the sympathetic division says, whoa, we need to run away or kill the killer clown. You would, you would open up the blood vessels to the large muscles of your arms, your legs, getting ready to run away or engage in your ninja battles with the killer clown. The opening of your lungs, the bronchies and bronchioles will spasm open to allow more airflow because engaging in ninja battles with killer clowns takes a lot of oxygen. So you need to start breathing faster and deeper. Now, what parts of your body don't need blood at that moment? Well, you don't need your immune system to fight off a killer clown. Now, you may get some diseases later, but right now you need to focus on fighting killer clown. That's why long-term stress can cause problems with your immune system. 
What else don't you need? Well, you had a nice dinner a few hours ago, but you don't need to digest it right then. So you shut off blood supply to your digestive system. Slow it down because you don't really need it. And sometimes that may be why you go if you've got too much food in your uh, stomach when you're all of a sudden going, ah, I need to fight. Your stomach may go, I can't handle this and reverse the pumps. Now, unless you've really got a thing for killer clowns, what other system don't you need at that moment? The reproductive system. So the blood supply to there gets shut down and you just are ready for fighting and flighting. Now, what's an opposite kind of situation? Thanksgiving. You eat Thanksgiving dinner. You have your portion of the turkey. You have about three pounds of turkey. You have mashed potatoes. You have everything else. And then you sit on the lazy boy recliner and then your body says, we do not need to have the heart rate racing. We do not need excess air in the lungs. We do not need your muscles to be pumping and using lots of energy. And instead, it shuts you down. Digestive system gets a lot and everything is good. Weirdly enough, the sympathetic division does activate one activity of the reproductive system. And that's either orgasm or it can actually activate labor, which is why that stereotype of the woman giving birth when she gets trapped in the elevator, there actually is some legitimacy to this. This means that if a lady is walking around, she's looking pretty pregnant, don't just jump up behind her and go, ah, and attack her with a chainsaw. That's just not nice to do. All right, now, I could go through the structures of the spinal column or spinal cord, but what most people want to know about is the brain. So let's take a look at the brain. There's four major regions of the brain, the brainstem, cerebellum, diencephalon, and cerebrum. If we take a look at this diagram here, this portion here, the light blue, weirdly purple, and light green thing there, that is the brain stem. This is the bottom of the brain, and even though this is not quite accurate, you can think of it as the part that evolved first, and it deals with those basic needs. This keeps your heart going, your lungs breathing. These are keeping you not dead kind of activities. Now, there are some other things that are involved there besides just keeping you not dead. There's some visual reflexes and some other things. Plus, all the signals that are coming up the spinal column uh, right at the bottom of this, they're passing through the brainstem. Now, this weird lump, the reddish lump that's be sitting behind the uh, brainstem is called the cerebellum, which means little brain, because it actually looks a lot like the bigger cerebrum that sits on top. And you can even see it has its white matter in this thing called the arbor vitae, which means white or tree of life. It's got its white matter on the inside, just like the cerebrum has white matter on the inside and gray matter on the outside. What does the cerebellum do? It does a number of things, but some of the most important things that it does is it helps regulate and coordinate motor control. Now, when you wish to move your right or left arm. You don't sit there and hope that your cerebellum does it. That's what the cerebrum's involved with. But the cerebellum is the thing that says, I wish to, no, the cerebrum says, I want to lift my left arm. The cerebellum says, well, okay, but I know Newton's third law, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. If I lift this arm, I'm gonna fall forwards. So the cerebellum says, tighten up trunk and keep me from flopping over when the cerebrum carries out its action. And it does that kind of smoothing things out. If this is the CEO of motor control, this is the middle management that makes the CEO's directives actually become reality. Now, you may not realize how much of this actually regulates. As I said, it's involved a lot in balance and it helps coordinate actions. And a lot of times, if it thinks the cerebrum's made a mistake, it will override it. This is why uh, sometimes if you're trying to do a muscle activity, like walking or climbing, especially if it's something complicated, if you start to think about what you're doing, you may get screwed up. Now, here's a weird little uh, thing that you can do. Stick out, sitting down, stick out your right leg and start rotating it clockwise. For you, that would be rotating it like this. Then, with your right hand in the air, draw the number six. Watch what happens to your leg. That's your cerebellum saying, warning, the CEO is stupid. Stop that cerebrum and it overrides. All right. Sitting on top of the brainstem, this weirdly yellow thing here is the diencephalon. And it's such a little part, but it's so important. This is where a lot of relay, uh, relaying of information starts happening. This part decides where things should go in the cerebrum. Plus, it starts doing a lot of the initial analysis of the data that's coming in and out of the brain. And it starts making some decisions. This is also where a lot of autonomic control of the body is decided upon. 
You see this little dangly guy there? That's the pituitary gland, the master gland of the endocrine system. And it's the diencephalon that controls the pituitary gland. So this is involved in a wide range of things, especially with this little part here called the hypothalamus. It can be involved in deciding whether or not you like something. Uh, it's involved in thermal regulation. Lots of functions are located there. Up here is the cerebrum. This is the perhaps most recently developed of the uh, parts of the brain, and this is what people think of as the brain. This is where your conscious thoughts probably mostly exist. Now, it's divided into primarily four major lobes. The frontal lobe in the front, the parietal lobe here, in the back you have the occipital lobe, and to the side, this is a cut open view of the brain, you have the temporal lobe. I often think of it kind of like a boxing glove, where the thumb is the temporal lobe, the fingers are the frontal lobe, the back of the palm is the parietal lobe, and then it breaks down. The occipital lobe is the back here. Weirdly enough, vision analysis happens in the occipital lobe. I don't know why it's not in the front. It would make a lot more sense. The temporal lobe, which is right by the ear, hey, that makes sense. It's involved in analysis of sound. It's also involved in analyzing things like smell. There's a number of other functions that go on in there. Um, involving there's some language stuff that goes on in there and memory is actually helped out by the uh, temporal lobe. The parietal lobe does a lot of analysis of touch, what you think of as touch. And in fact, right where you go from parietal lobe to frontal lobe, you have this ridge called the primary somatic, motor, uh, primary somatic sensory area where you have the individual neurons that are listening to signals from different parts of your body. And they've actually done things where they've run along with electrode somebody's uh, that uh, little ridge there, and you'll, the person will say, I'm reporting a tickling sensation or something, and it seems to run along their body, and they can map it out. And so you'll have lots of that brain portion dedicated to analyzing information from your hand, but not so much to analyzing information from your elbow. Similarly, the frontal lobe has right by that, has a ridge that controls those muscles. And again, if you run your electrode along it, you'll see the person won't feel anything, but their body will start to move. And that's called the primary somatic motor area. The rest of the frontal lobe is involved in things like executive function and conscious decision making and speech. So this is where you start thinking, hmm, what do I really want for my birthday? Now other parts of the brain may, want, may come up with, I'm hungry. But you may be thinking, uh, yes, birthday cake is nice, but I think I want a leather jacket. There's portions of it right up here that are involved in very long-term judgment. And this is the parts that right now as a teenager, if you're watching this, this is the part that's, this is fascinating to me. It's growing and developing right now, which is why every day as you age, you're getting smarter and wiser. And assuming that you don't do things to impede its development, you're gonna be a very wise and smart individual, especially after watching this video. And by two, I can't do this with you two laughing back there. <laughs> So if we had, no, that's not right, three coplanar points. So have you ever gotten off an airplane? <laughs> that should be... Less than. Yeah. Dang. Is it like 500 degrees in here or what? All right, so when you're in chemistry class, you're going to be doing a lot of work. You're going to be starting over. So as an example, we could consider like you've got a chain hanging from two, um, to fix. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>